Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Our topic today is uh, strategic outlook for South Asia. What we're looking at is that here is a, an area which is has common cultural heritage, um, common history, uh, but is the least integrated economically. And it presents, uh, to my mind, uh, a great opportunity. Hi. I know there are lots of issues about politics between our countries. And considering the theme of this conference uh, about a fractured world, we're actually quite a fractured lot in South Asia. So I think it's quite appropriate that we should uh, look at this subject. And I uh, would like that we put politics aside and do some blue skying, dreaming, thinking that what are the possibilities which can happen in this region? After all, uh, who would imagine after the Second World War and the kind of wars these Europe has had between the countries that they would form the European common market? Uh, similar situation has been in, in our subcontinent. There have been um, <coughs> wars, but I think the possibilities of being uh, a common market is something we should think about. Consider the infinite possibilities. A population of 1.67 billion, a middle class of around 400 million, another 150 odd million earning as much as or higher than those in the wealthiest Central European nations, a population that buys 4 million cars, 20 million, 21 million two-wheelers, and 200 million smartphones a year. These are just some of the most mouth-watering opportunities for business in South Asia. And the economies of India, Bhutan, Bangladesh are growing around 6 to 7%. Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and Nepal, just a shade lower. South Asia could easily double regional trade from the anemic $23 billion, which is there today. Yet, this is a region of missed opportunities. It remains one of the world's least <coughs> integrated regions. Intra-regional trade accounts for only 5% of South Asia's total trade. Exports constitute only around 10% of South Asia's GDP. This is the lowest of all regions, barring sub-Saharan uh, Africa. And we don't have to look any further than the ASEAN to understand how to convert a strong regional and cultural similarities into infinite possibilities. How an economic grouping of 644 million people reverse the trend of global trade in favor of intra-region trade and generates an annual GDP of 2.7 trillion. So can South Asia deliver on the grand opportunity and how? And you can see that what an enormous opportunity there is if we can uh, get this whole idea going. I have with me a distinguished <coughs> panel to discuss this. Um, we're not fully represented for the whole, all, the whole region, um, but I think that uh, people have studied this subject and will be um, quite knowledgeable about what we're going to talk about. I have with me Mr. Gaurav Dalmia from India. He is uh, a serial investor uh, in various businesses. Uh, he's constantly looking for opportunities, so I think this couldn't be a bigger opportunity for him um, <laughs> to discuss. We have uh, Dr. Sanya Nishta, who has uh, done enormous work in healthcare, uh, and it, um, has also been somebody who has uh, um, almost got elected to the Director General of WHO, and has studied uh, very closely cooperation, collaboration, which can happen between our countries um, on various aspects, not only on medical, uh, cultural, and so forth. I have uh, Mr. Ajay Singh, who is also a serial entrepreneur um, in aviation, uh, CEO of SpiceJet, somebody who's turned around companies, and also has been uh, instrumental and spearheaded Mr. Modi's campaign um, in 2014, which we all know has been such a success. And he's close to the BJP government, and somebody who is in civil aviation has to have a geopolitical political perspective on most things. So uh, I think I'm sure he'll have lots of things to say. And one of the big issues I think is 
connectivity between our countries. We have uh, Vijay Sharma, who is uh, uh, from Paytm, um, an internet entrepreneur uh, into digital payments, and now he's in a bank, um, a very enterprising person uh, in the business, which is very, uh, very timely in India because we just went through demonetization and digital payments is a big thing which is being promoted in India. So he's the right man in the right place. And I'm sure he sees opportunities in, in South Asia as a whole. So let me start um, first with Ajay Singh. I, I want you to tell us about how you see this opportunities which exist in South Asia, because connectivity is a very important part of this whole, whole game. Um, and you must have looked at possibilities. Uh, you also are part of the kind of think tank of, of this government. Uh, so let us hear your views on this. Well, uh, as you said, uh, the possibilities are endless. 5% uh, uh, of our trade is between the South Asian countries. If you look at the other blocks, NAFTA has more than 50% of the trade happening within NAFTA. Uh, if you look at the EU, uh, that's again about 57-58% of the trade happening within the EU. So I think it's a great pity that uh, we should not be trading more. We should not be just having more business links uh, with each other. Uh, as far as uh, connectivity is concerned, connectivity follows trade, of course. If there was more trade, there would be more connectivity. Uh, and while we are connected uh, uh, by air links uh, to most of the South Asian countries, uh, they are, the, the links are extremely sparse and uh, we really need to do more. Just as we talk of having a single economic block, <clears throat> we really need, need to consider uh, if we can have open skies, uh, you know, a, a system by which uh, airlines from countries within South Asia can fly to each other without restriction. And if we could do that, uh, that would give a huge boost to, to trade as well as to tourism in all South Asian countries. I think it's a great pity that, uh, uh, you know, the most populous countries in the world today, uh, Delhi and Karachi and Lahore and Mumbai, amongst the most populous countries in the world today, have little or no air connectivity at all. So uh, great possibilities for trade and commerce, great possibilities for tourism, uh, you know, great possibilities for air connectivity, connectivity of all sorts. Uh, great possibilities for bringing down the cost of our economies by doing business with each other. Very often, business is being done between India and Pakistan through through Dubai, uh, the Gulf states, yeah. uh, which is a huge pity. It's also hugely expensive to do this. So uh, this whole you know five trillion dollar economy that uh, the Prime Minister spoke about yesterday for India by 2025, that date would probably get advanced if. Uh, we just had greater links with each other. Thank you. In fact, I read somewhere in a report that it's cheaper to trade for India to trade with Brazil than with Pakistan in terms of just um, connectivity and so forth. Um, Dr. Sanya, um, you've studied this region and uh, looked at various areas of cooperation and collaboration between, spe specifically between India and Pakistan, but. Let's look at the whole region. What are the possibilities you consider uh, which could be there where there could be cooperation and collaboration and how can we open up these borders? Well, certainly there are many opportunities. It's a question of how you're willing to tap them. And I think that it's very important to understand what the imperative is. Uh, clearly, we've, Mr. Ajay has talked about you know the potential of boosting trade and what it would mean for our economies. and. Uh, it w and what it would mean in terms of uh, eradicating poverty, assuming that governments would have the ability to accrue the benefits of that economic growth equitably to population. So there's clearly a huge untapped potential there. But I think we need to recognize the imperative of collaboration, uh, especially at this point in time, because the world is very different from what it was uh, 10 years ago or even a few years ago. I mean, the sustainable development agenda to which all our countries have signed up to has ushered in a very different paradigm compared to what was the norm in the past. I mean, in the frame of development, 
uh, the norm in the past was that the developed countries had compacts with the developing world and they would go and th under the framework of the Millennium Development Goals have uh, bilateral relationships and multilateral relationships. But the premise of the sustainable development agenda is to focus the uh, systems and processes of the countries to strengthen systems so that the international system can focus on where it has a comparative advantage. So essentially that means that the onus of development, the onus of system strengthening, the onus of trade and cooperation is on countries themselves and regional collaboration and regional institutions are a very important tool for that. Um, unfortunately, we do not have uh, the convening institutions uh, for us to be able to engage. Um, I mean, last year I was, uh, I campaigned extensively as one of the finalists for uh, Director General of the World Health Organization and in that role, uh, you have to study regional institutions very carefully because that's, that's, how, you, uh, that's how you seek support and votes. Um, and I have to say our region is by far, um, you know, the least integrated I mean, look at the Caribbean and the Latin Americans and how they've moved on, uh, you know, to financial integration, to regulatory, to being on uh, common standards and regulatory collaboration. And um, so even the smallest countries of the world, those are that, that, that are least developed, are finding common grounds to converge because they realize that it gives them voice and representation and a seat at the table in the international system and that it b boosts trade and is good for their economies and they're, they're able to capitalize on sharing of experiences and pool the paltry resources that they have. Uh, and I think that countries of South Asia um, stand to gain significantly from pooling uh, resources, you know, in terms of human capital. I mean, in today's digital age, and I'm sure the expert here will, uh, will bear me out, I mean, th this is a world which is completely changed. Um, we now know for sure that two thirds of the wealth of a country uh, is its human capital. And in fact, in the years to come, the borrowing ability of a country will be affected um, by its progress on human development. Now that, how do you power economies in an, in an environment like so that? So what do you think are the, the stumbling blocks? I mean, in the sense that how do we move forward on this? We know that all these possibilities exist, um, the development of human capital and the fact that we should be trading with each other and exchanging far more in, in cultural terms. And, and, and considering that we have such a common heritage, what do you think? And, you know, India and Pakistan are two big gorillas in the room, right? And they, they're the ones who don't talk to each other too well. Tell me, what do you think is the way forward and what are the real stumbling blocks in this? So in terms of a tangible way forward, we need to have uh, functioning regional institutions. Unfortunately, SARC hasn't taken off in the way that CARICOM did, in, in, in the way that so many other regional institutions around the world did, ASEAN. I mean, I can go on with the long list of regional institutions in Latin America alone. So I think we need to have functioning regional institutions that provide a convening space not just for governments, but but people and um, and businessmen and you know individuals from the social sector. And alongside that, we need to invest um, in the right um, uh, you know to have the right evidence to bring to the table in terms of the benefits of collaboration, because whenever there have been exchanges and and a proactive stance to get countries of the region together. I mean, there are odd op-eds in the news here and there, but there isn't the science-based evidence, you know, drawn from um, analytical, serious analytical work that brings to bear the benefits of collaboration. And, you know, there aren't enough champions who are willing to stand on either side of the border to say, well, we need to step aside from politics and look up and think about the future of a quarter of the world's population and what regional integration? Well, I know about India and Pakistan. I mean, there's, whenever I travel to Pakistan, it's a great affinity between the two people, you know, in terms of this, uh, besides just leave politics aside, uh, there's a great commonality, affinity, love, and desire to, to do things together. Um, I'm always puzzled of why it doesn't happen. In fact, uh, when I was there during the last Pakistan election, and I met, uh, at that time, a candidate, Nawaz Sharif, and there were great, uh, power shortages in Lahore. 
And he said, why can't India supply us power? You know, and I would love to get power from India. Uh, the moment you get this kind of connectivity, you're not going to get any kind of wars going on because you're so dependent on each other. Right? But I, of I, course, I, that all just went up into thin air. Yeah, I don't mean to dominate the conversation, but, but clearly we need regional institutions. We need to start talking to each other. We, you know, we need to open a dialogue because without a dialogue, we're not going to be able to come to common grounds on what the problems in our are and where the solutions need to be. And I strongly feel that we need to invest in uh, institutions that can provide the high the hard evidence, and then we need to have the right communication strategies. So I think in terms of a starting point, the convening platforms would be an absolute prerequisite. Gora, you're a man looking for opportunities. What do you see in this? Well, I think as a backdrop, I just want to build on the point just made. People of India and people of Pakistan are not at war with each other. The government of India and the government of Pakistan tend to get into skirmishes all the time. And the test of that really is, and we were talking about this earlier, if you go to New York City, Indian and Pakistani cab drivers live together almost as one community. So the, given that backdrop, the possibilities of trade and investment and so on and so forth are real. Okay. So if you just look at India and Pakistan, there could be a lot of manufactured good exports from India. You spoke about power. There could be a lot of things of that type. There could be gas and apparel and stuff like that with Bangladesh. So there are a lot of cross-border synergies which need to be exploited by business people but enabled by governments. Today the restriction is that there are a lot of barriers to opening up this kind of trade or manufacturing or uh, investment. And I would think it makes sense for governments to act, to open this up. And the benefits would accrue almost immediately because of trade. If we don't integrate, look at the the worst case scenario, if we don't integrate, the risk is India and uh, uh, this region will become a proxy for India-China kind of conflict if we don't integrate. So it's better we integrate looking that those forces are at play. So what do you think are the stumbling blocks? I think the stumbling blocks are essentially political, uh, trade-related regulations. Uh, people will take time to invest because they're not knowledgeable about local markets, but that's beginning to happen. Vijay, what do you see opportunities here in the digital space in terms of um, banking, financial services, maybe e-commerce? You're in e-commerce now too. Yeah, I think um, we are totally understanding the opportunity. Uh, look at this, that when India got independent, then independent, then uh, we worked with sort of few Europeans, Americans, and Japanese companies, and. Suzuki's largest market effectively today is India. So um, Indian companies, if let's say there is a physical trade barrier, so to say, at least there is no digital trade barrier. I think um, we are leaving our markets open to Americans, Chinese, and other companies to fight us domestic players uh, versus those large conglomerates who can spend disproportionate amount of money and play out so local opportunities will effectively become global markets. And global markets dominated by a few of those who are not necessarily long-term going to contribute in those countries. Digital is a disproportionately bigger opportunity because it doesn't require many other concerns like border cross, physical export, import of those things. You could remotely do this. Cloud services could be the way to distribute things. Um, I think I think some of us in these regions, considering we are the identified while we are known as blue collar workers at uh, hard workers at, and then even the knowledge economy leaders, uh, the idea is that one of us, some of us from India probably or from uh, other neighboring countries should take a stand up and then say that this is our consortium. One of the uh, you know ride sharing company Ola in India uh, built up a partnership in the region. But it was not Ola driven, it was a partnership. Ola joined a consortium built by a Chinese company. Effectively, what I'm trying to say is that China has a far more ambition on this reason than this reason has its own ambition on this reason. I think that is something we should be worried about. And while China has ambition and a learning, and thanks to the proxy nearby learning and experiences, um, even Americans and Japanese could left behind. So. Uh, opportunities, no, 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 nobody doubts it. Uh, similarities, nobody doubts it. Experience and the linear progression of what we've done in India, what we've done in the region can go. 
Um, I take a few examples, and the question that why it has not happened, and I take a few examples, and there is a little bit of learning there. Uh, Bahati Airtel tried Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, and finally came back. Uh, then there are a few companies, I, I mean, there are regional... Why aircraft. did they come back? Ultimately, the, I think what's what's happening is that I, I, it's a particular company case, so less of, of a pattern here, but at the macro, I could say that um, all... Uh, so when you are an economy, there are frontier markets below you and there are senior markets above you. So more or less, they, everything below you requires more patience, a disproportionate large amount of patience. Even though Bhati got out of this and went to Africa, which is a little bit confusing, it was better to be here than to be in Africa if there was a growth of market level. But the point I'm trying to bring is that we all have to understand that when we go neighboring markets, these will be very small numbers for us. Um, a lot of people want Paytm in Nepal, and I'm not sure why should we quote unquote, invest our time. When I say invest our time, it means bandwidth constraints and what should I not do? But I think uh, there, there has to be an understanding that if together we stand, we can become a, like you said in starting off this, that there is a EU, there is NAFTA, <coughs> there is, if we together can become one market, at least for digital world, if not for physical world led things, there is a very big opportunity for all of us to do it. Companies could open up to collaboration, investments, it's, India has large investment now, thanks to the attraction of the local market, but we are not going neighboring countries to invest that money. Uh, even Nepal, Bhutan, or Sri Lanka, or Bangladesh, who, who's the player of, of financial services there? Another Chinese person, mm. another other Asian person, not Indian. Um, I think it, either we have not looked at it like this as a country, now the, coming to the stumbling blocks, either we as Indians have not looked at it, that there is an opportunity, we've looked at them as a, uh, sort of either an aggressive sibling or a younger, too younger market that we don't need to bother. Either that is one of the anchor, or we all get emotionally charged first, then rationally business savvy. Ajay, um, the topic of China came up. Right? And, um, China has ambitions, the OBOR is coming here, India hasn't participated in it. Um, how do you think the Chinese initiatives in this region are going to affect our possible integration uh, of s uh, between our countries? Well, I think it's quite clear that uh, China means to dominate this region. Uh, as we all know, China has also applied for membership of the SARC. Uh, and they, they, they would like to get into SARC and dominate SARC as well. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think we need to be careful. Uh, we uh, need to ensure that China is not able to use its proximity with Pakistan as a proxy for getting into uh, into the SARC. Uh, and I think uh, paradoxically, the uh, you know one of the solutions could be to follow what India and China have done in relations uh, between each other, which is to say, look, we have water disputes with each other. Let's put those aside. Let's put those aside. Let, let's just freeze those disputes in time. And let's focus on other areas where we can collaborate. And if somehow we could, we can start to do that with Pakistan, and, and let's be under no illusions. The problem with SARC is the relationship between India and Pakistan. That's the biggest problem. Yeah. And that is what we need to sort out. And if we can, you know, we need to build that trust slowly. It's it uh, it's not something that will be done, uh, you know, in, in, in just a few years' time. So perhaps what we can say is that, look, here, here is a dispute which we just freeze in time, which is the dispute regarding Kashmir and the border. And we focus on trade uh, and, and, and work with each other to make sure that uh, uh, both countries can, can actually benefit. If we can, if we can just follow that model, I think uh, that would be absolutely fantastic for this, for this region. And I think in part, all, a lot of this India's look east policy and India's engagement with ASEAN is because they're having this trouble on their western frontier. And so they say, look, you know, let's not waste our time here. Let's go, go into the ASEAN and let's try and build closer economic links with ASEAN. Dr. Sanya, um, how do you see it from Pakistan in terms of uh, the fact that we're not able to um, open up? Let's look at India and Pakistan just bilaterally. Um, why is it that Pakistan is not, is there a kind of a fear complex in Pakistan about India coming and dominating in um, their economy? Um, and that's why they move closer to China. And most of the trade goes through UAE. Um, India has given MF MFN status. Uh, Pakistan hasn't reciprocated. What is your view on this? How will it play out? 
and why does it not play out? Well, uh, you talked about the fear factor. Certainly there is no fear factor there. Uh, I have been part of many um, bilateral initiatives, you know, the, of, the, of the kind that focus on uh, building cultural and so social bridges between the two countries. And whenever there has been, uh, whenever there has been such an initiative, Pakistan has welcomed, uh, you know, communities from the other side of the border with, with, uh, with a lot of sincerity at a, at a people to people level and with open arms. I myself was uh, the co-chair with Naresh Trihan, your brother-in-law. We, we both co-chaired the, um, the health committee of Amin Kiyasha and I, I distinctly recall uh, the intent to collaborate on both sides because we have common problems. I mean, the threat of emerging and re-emerging infections is, is real and it's, it could potentially devastate the world not to talk about the region. So it is, in our common, it is in our common interest to speak to each other as far as surveillance of disease is concerned. Whenever we talk about universal health coverage and we go to international meetings, the Indians and Pakistanis are talking about the same thing. We're mm. talking about the unruly uh, private healthcare sector that needs to be, you know, that need, whose potential needs to be harnessed. And we're talking about traditional providers and informal providers and the issue of spurious drugs, which is common. And whenever we talk about reform, you have the RSBY, we have our insurance schemes, which are built on similar lines. We have ASHAs, you have ASHAs, we have lady health workers, and you know, the eye clinics and the burgeoning of the various technological innovations in the social sectors are quite similar because our systems have evolved from the same uh, colonial background. So the, so the systemic constraints are similar, the impediments um, are similar, and likewise the solution uh, could, could benefit from collaborating. So, um, I mean, in Pakistan... So why do these initiatives fizzle out? I mean, they don't end up as with much to show at the end. I mean, the one Aman Ki Asha, even the one you did, very laudable things. Things are not, not politically charged in that sense. They're all about health and, and culture and so forth. So why do they fizzle out? Why do they not get, get bigger instead of just tapering off? Well, and I circle back to what I said right at the very beginning. We need we need convening spaces. We need convening spaces for people to people contact and exchange and dialogue on on purely humanitarian and social sector subjects, which have nothing to do with politics. I mean, uh, people in India and Pakistan and Bangladesh and the rest of the world have have common problems, and we need to be committed to to humanitarianism and hum and you know to bringing improvements in humanity at large and to poverty eradication and to social sector goals that are not controversial from any perspective. And those kind of exchanges and dialogues could be insulated from, from whatever politics entails on both sides. And I think that that will um, augur trust and peace building and health could be, I mean, Naresh and I tried very hard to use health as an entry point to peace building between the two countries. I mean, there is, um, we know that you know a lot of Pakistanis seek healthcare in your country. Yeah. Uh, I mean the, the liver transplant units, which is something that is in the phase of development in my part in my country, is something that you're quite further along in having deployed and specialized. And um, I think one of the one of the easiest things to do so is why do the people in power don't realize this that all these benefits which are could accrue to both countries uh, it somehow stops somewhere, right? Why is it that civil society is not able to impress the politicians that these are important things that we should move forward on? It's, it, it's uh, beneficial to everybody. Right? Why does it not move? Well, people in power are not a homogenous community on either side. There are those who would much rather further exchange and communication as an entry point to lasting peace. And of course, on either side of the border, there are others who uh, do not want to see that happening because of narrow interests. And we have to be mindful that civil society can uh, can really push, and the academics in particular, and the researchers and reformers can really push for uh, for collaboration because there is no other way than to speak to each other. I mean, currently we're just, there, there's a total impasse. I mean, yeah. I, I'm not taking delegations. Naresh is not bringing delegations. And we're unable to because there's a lot of unpredictability in terms of visas, and there are transport impediments, which, uh, as you know very well, um, 
uh, and, and our governments are not speaking to each other except for sporadic exchange between uh, the national security advisors and that too on a very sporadic and opportunistic basis. We, we need to engage each other. I mean, if, if there is mistrust and if there are concerns and issues, there is no substitute to engagement. And I, I would very much like that, uh, that to happen. Uh, by the way, I'm not a trade expert and you referred to the, the, um, MFN. the MFN status. Uh, I, I, uh, my sense is that we have given very favorable positions uh, to the other side as well. I mean, when, you, when, you're, when you're across Vaga border, there are lines of trucks on, uh, from your side, which we, which we welcome. We, 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 of course, welcome trade for, uh, from both sides. Yeah, Gaurav? You know, I'd like to make one point. I'm not a geopolitical expert, but it's often been said that if India and Pakistan synchronize their elections, half the political rhetoric <laughs> will stop, yeah. you know? And you'll be back in business because sometimes there's rhetoric in India because elections are coming up, that slows down. Then there's election in Pakistan and the rhetoric builds up. Of course, the problem in India is that uh, there are elections all the time. Right. So how would you even <laughs> synchronize anything? Uh, no, but I must <laughs> say that in India, um, That's until not. recently, Pakistan has never been an issue uh, in elections, it's always been some local issues, right? Uh, but, but, but I don't uh, know whether in Pakistan, it's, India is more of a, sometimes more of an issue in terms of. Uh, well, uh, I don't. Uh, I'm not a government representative at this mm -hmm. panel, and I'm totally apolitical. I have no party affiliations. But to be fair to all the political parties, India has never factored into uh, you know election pledges. So nobody will fight an election in Pakistan on an anti-India ticket. So our politicians regardless of who they are, by and large, are very mindful of that. So they don't stoke public um, support uh, through the anti-India rhetoric. Uh, and and we're very careful about that. Would you agree with that, Ajay? I think a part of the problem is also the media, by the way. Oh, okay. You know, <laughs> uh, I think that, uh, you know, your kin sometimes uh, provoke a lot of trouble as well. Uh, there are some channels, and I don't want to name them, uh, who always appear to be pushing, I think, and I, I, I guess they exist on both sides of the border. They always seem to be pushing for, for, for war. And uh, I don't know if this, this gets eyeballs or uh, why this happens, but for, you know, the littlest of, of uh, provocations seem to be blown up. And uh, I think this is something that a responsible media needs to stop doing. And they need to understand that what they're doing is actually taking away uh, from economic progress which can really happen in the region and and a large part of the responsibility uh, in my view belongs to india india is 80 percent of of the south asian economy yeah. and it's it's more than 80 percent of the population of this uh, of this region and you know it's 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 not enough for india to just say that look china is encircling us they they, they are doing this port in sri lanka or they are doing this uh, government in nepal or they're doing something else in in uh, uh, Bhutan and Doklam and all this uh, stuff. I think India needs to go and repair relations with its Western neighbor. The disproportionate responsibility belongs to India. Uh, and uh, I don't think it is enough for India to say that, okay, we'll engage with just about everybody else in South Asia and try and build links, uh, but not do it with Pakistan. So just if I, yeah. if you allow me a follow-up yeah. comment on that, I couldn't agree more with you. But in terms of, and as I said earlier, and I reiterate that the, the politicians, um, notwithstanding all their <coughs> other faults on other sides, have never stoked this, uh, you know, for their election rhetoric. But in terms of the media, I agree with you that there are inflammatory segments on on either side. Yeah, I, I, uh, on either side. I won't defend that. <laughs> so uh, you see, we have common problems. So if we were speaking to each other, if we we were in a dialogue, we would be sitting around the table and saying, well, here is a problem that is common. We have a small s s uh, faction of the media stoking um, distrust on either side. What is it that we can do about it? Do we need to speak to our regulatory agencies to bring uh, standards and norms that could be uh, a, a safeguard against that? So I think I circle back to the issue of the need to have that connection to speak. Because without that, we will be on either side of that red line that we uh, Ajay, do you, are you saying that India is not trying hard enough? I think we need to try harder, definitely. Uh, I think that, uh, uh, you know, we are in this vicious uh, circle where, uh, where uh, 
it's become almost fashionable to bash your neighbor mm. uh, and and uh, it is presumed that uh, because so much media is is bashing uh, our neighbors it must be something which is popular uh, with the people and therefore must be something which 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 potentially gets you votes i think there needs to be a serious dialogue uh, within india uh, about the benefits and i i completely agree with you when you say that i think these benefits are not really quantified nobody really understands exactly nobody understands that that a closer collaboration what that might mean to the people of of india let alone the people of south asia i think i think that needs to be studied that needs to be uh, explained much better uh, and that needs to be obvious to policy makers i i can tell you that most policy makers do not understand that trade is so abysmal and actually trade could be could be really really significant mm. and could really boost our uh, you know or, or fast forward our national goal of of uh, becoming uh, you know the world's second or third largest economy you know, well it's ironical that we are having this discussion of integration of south asia in <coughs> davos right, which is a conversation we never have in india or in yes. pakistan yes. we are always talking about the border and kashmir and skirmishes and so forth um so i think that that's one of the things which needs to be done in this region we need to talk more within ourselves and media also has a responsibility in terms of what are the benefits of us integrating and creating this possibility that yes there is a possibility that we can have uh, a more integrated region where everybody benefits and i don't think that that conversation really happens in india or in pakistan or any other parts of the of the region and, and i think that, that and that's that conversation has to be evidence based it had it has to be based on data and science and hard evidence in terms of what the future projections uh, could look like if we yeah i mean but that's there i mean there's a lot of data available of what are the possibilities so yeah, i think but just we, it, it's not know, focused yeah, yeah it's who, nobody talks about it. it as a possibility even uh, vijay uh, you have I, Mr. Pri, you've seen it for more number of years than probably some of us would have seen because you have had a lens of media also and different curves. Um, we just learned two different solutions that media could normalize themselves to different and the uh, election could synchronize. Uh, what would you say that why Indians find it more fashionable like we just learned and it is there and now that social media will allow this to go for far away than an editor could decide now i mean it's it's gone beyond hand of a media now actually i would say um then at the same point of time these aman ka asha innovations and th- such conversations uh, they 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 sort of have like we said uh, pro and con in the city in any city that you talk about is it that we are too emotionally charged as a history of your last 30 40 years that you say that when we became or is it that we don't want to forget the history here is it some old thing that is not brew, that is brewing it backward or is it a incremental thing that is an issue ajay yeah. you want to say ajay, something ajay, no, i just I, I just want to say quickly that uh, you know as you pointed out this history existed in other parts of the world yeah yeah what what worse history uh, could be could, could the be there wars, than yeah. europe and and the world war yeah. so we need to forget this history and and i think that you know we say that we are the youngest nation in the world today 800 million people under the age of 35 in india i would think that uh, this is a new generation and they probably have uh, fewer wounds of of partition and and all the problems that have occurred in the past and the wars that have uh, happened in the past in 1971 when we had had a war i most of the kids most of the people of india were not born oh, yeah. and and therefore we need to leave this uh, this past behind i think it's 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 for media and it's for for political leadership not to keep reminding people of that past and try and build a common future and just a bit further on that <coughs> i mean going back to the history of europe uh, i mean the reason why they uh, have left their differences behind was because they started with trade and there were financial yes. interdependencies and ultimately they realized that it was in their common interest to collaborate and forget about what happened in the past it's entirely possible in our region as well i had hoped that when the post partition generation came into power that things would change right uh, unfortunately they haven't changed uh, they've still somehow we're stuck with the same um, my uh, mind blocks you know one more thing i think of is we don't think or talk enough about the upside take yeah. a few anecdotes 
Grameen Bank happened in Bangladesh. What they did, our cultural situation, our sociological situation is very similar. The same would be in Pakistan. Just best practices from Grameen Bank could help us so much if yeah. we integrated further. If you just look at the hydropower potential of Nepal, okay, it could transform Nepal. Okay, if you looked at it, the largest uh, motorcycle manufacturer is an Indian company. One of the greatest manufacturing hubs for automobiles, cars, is India. If you look at what transformation could happen to the Indian automotive sector if we integrated, and similarly, there'll be things in Pakistan. Pakistan is spending valuable foreign exchange in yeah. getting, you know, yeah. importing cars. So we don't and think and about the upside. We think about the so-called dysfunctional Dysfunct aspects which are there in any society. It, and it is the mistrust that is eclipsing the, you know, the potential to, um, you know, draw advantages from regional collaboration. Okay. We'll come back to that in our end to see how to overcome this mistrust. I'll open it up to the audience uh, if people want to ask questions. Um, if there's anybody from Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, <laughs> uh, you know, don't want to make it an India-Pakistan mm -hmm. debate. Mm -hmm. um, yes, madam. You, did you want to ask a question? Um, sure. Um, uh, thank you. I have a comment, but I also love if you know some of the panel can also respond. I think the narrative about how Ch China is seeking to dominate the region is a dangerous one. Uh, particularly when actually the largest foreign direct uh, investment comes from the US and Japan, I believe in India, but also uh, Japan is very effective across the region. And so underpinning that fear, I'm not entirely sure what it is, but I think this is a fantastic opportunity to dus discuss. Um, and then, of course, prior to Prime Minister Modi coming here, um, you know, he kind of stopped off in Israel and has now become, you know, really good friends with Israel. And so I thought that, you know, kind of uh, bilateral relationship uh, is also really beneficial. And just as a last comment, you know, I think China overall, as with any other country that has now sort of um, uh, 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 opportunities to go abroad, uh, wishes to, you know, share. And could there be a more positive, constructive relationship with China, as well as many other countries that seeks to support this uh, regional collaboration? Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah. Raji? Uh, do you think, Ajay, we do not, we have border conflict with China, Doklam, you said it, and China has more comfort with Pakistan. Is that the double reason that we fear that China, even though the numbers speak something else? Uh, I think so. But, uh, you know, irrespective of uh, what is happening at the Doklam border, I think that the two nations are mature enough to say that, look, trade will go on and that we will, we will continue to work with each other on areas of mutual interest. And I think the same needs to be done with Pakistan. Uh, I think I think the way India and China have handled relations with each other has actually been extremely constructive. Yeah. Uh, and and while while there is concern in India about the circling of India and China would feel that we are you know uh, perhaps building a relationship with the Taiwan or with the with the you know countries adjoining China, uh, I think both nations are mature enough to understand that they are going to be global powers, and they will not be global powers if if the relationship between the two most populous nations in the world. Uh, doesn't work at a at a commercial level. Okay, okay so my, my, sorry, right. you had something to say. <coughs> so just a thirty second response to reiterate what you, the importance of what you're saying. I think China is a global player in today's multipolar world, and its interest in the South Asian region and SARC in particular should be welcomed. Of course, every country has the right to think about its own um, interests, but I think that China's interest in the region and in SARC in particular is really an opportunity which, which we should tap. I think it's not mutually exclusive. I mean, you can be friends Ab with China and absolutely, with India. Absolutely. Everybody should benefit. Absolutely. Yes. My, right. my question is uh, to Dr. Nishtar and to uh, Mr. Singh. Uh, you know, this is uh, because you've been the minister and you've, you, you're uh, very actively involved in, uh, in the BJP. You know, isn't it also about biting the bullet politically, political bullet, and, you know, कि हम एक दूसरे का नमक खा सकते हैं एक दूसरे का प्याज खा सकते हैं एक दूसरे से चीनी ले सकते हैं कि नहीं बिकॉज़ दैट इज द स्टार्टिंग पॉइंट ऑफ ऑल दैट बिकॉज़ दैट बिकम्स अ ह्यूज पॉलिटिकल हॉट पोटैटो फॉर फॉर बोथ द नेशंस व्हेनेवर देयर आर यू नो रिक्वायरमेंट्स एंड देन यू एंड अप इंपोर्टिंग वाया वाया दुबई और वाया यू नो ओमान और कतर और एनीथिंग लाइक दैट सो यू नो व्हेन दिस दीस थिंग्स आर डिस्कस्ड व्हेन द विद इन द गवर्नमेंट आर दीस थिंग्स यू नो 
thrown out for uh, for uh, want of political willpower do you want to go first <laughs> one uh well i think that uh, biting the political bullet uh, is uh, is an issue uh, but i think that the perception on the indian side has always been that it's not enough to talk to the politicians on the other side and there needs to be confidence building with the pakistani army uh, and that is an issue that really needs some resolution if uh, if 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 it needs a dialogue with the pakistani army then so be it let there be a dialogue with the pakistani army but there needs to be a dialogue there is no substitute for dialogue uh, as uh, uh, ma'am was saying you cannot stop talking to each other you cannot have sporadic dialogue with each other we owe it to our our region to have uh, you know a framework of consistent uh, dialogue and consistent people to people contacts and uh, i don't even think that this is politically unpopular uh, i think uh, mr modi when he was sworn in uh, actually invited yeah. uh, all the leaders of the south asian countries uh, and they were all gracious enough to attend his swearing in uh after that uh, on mr nawaz sharif's birthday uh, the prime minister actually did make a visit to pakistan so i if if this was politically unpopular he would not have done these things clearly it is not so we just need uh, to find a framework in which this dialogue can happen and can include all interested parties including uh, perhaps the armed forces well so just to follow up on that um normally there there is an issue with political governments all over the world that issue is not specific to pakistan it's not specific to india it's not specific to south asia it's germane to um where, where, wherever governments turn around every 5 years and have to go into the election mode by default their focus is very much on short term goals to the detriment of long term uh, thinking about a country's future and i think the key is to engage stakeholders on either side of the border also uh where you can uh kind of move away from this policy vacillation which is inherent to change in governments uh and this those stakeholders also include academics and uh, long and opinion shapers and you know individuals who wield influence in in the business world and to the and the chambers of commerce and the other business communities uh but again we circle back to the issue of the dialogue and the need for convening yeah, we don't hear these voices yeah. i mean even the chambers of commerce exactly. i think should be talking more exactly. about uh, mutual beneficial trade and and they uh, should be given more visibility and participation in the public discourse uh, uh, in the media rather than having you know a minority from either side and i would say that there is certainly the minority on either side who are stoking in uh, you know mi- mistrust and uh, so is stoking trouble rather than them if we had the sustainable convening space uh, for individuals who had the ability to draw on ev- evidence and bring to bear the right narrative which would um, uh, bear fruit for the f- for the future of both nations it would it would be in our interest no i i just want to say about you talked about the media and i i agree with you the media should have responsibility in this and you know our <laughs> anchor general is going to war every evening uh with pakistan i think it's a <laughs> reflection also of what's happening in in india in terms of this we have become more fractured and the fact that um taking a stand against pakistan has become a a popular thing to do and i it gets a lot of these people where people start shouting and abusing each other um gets trps and there's no doubt about this and i think that's that's, that's how the media get its rating so we, we we have to go fundamentally we have to go fundamentally back to some of the core parameters that need to change i mean how how are the media ratings built up and what factors into that calculation and what is the motivation of the political system to um, you know to brew up a certain narrative and, and of course things. what is the value of these media ratings compared to the value of yeah uh, trade between the nations good with all due respect i'm sorry um but hakeem saeed is real he's not a figment of our imagination so it's very difficult to forget um things going on when there's real bloodshed happening on both sides i mean bloodshed has to stop 
before a conversation can start. Well, no, yeah, nobody would disagree with that. Yeah, so. Um, but. Um, and I have a follow up question. Just, uh, I know you're not a political person, but you're still an important opinion maker of your country. So, as uh, an important opinion maker, uh, how would you feel if, uh, you know, everybody knows that he's a perpetrator of 2611 Mumbai attacks, and yet your prime minister refers to him as G, and he will not be, no court will be able to ever, you know, uh, put him to, uh, put him in jail or something like that. If, if a prime minister refers to it like that, how do you expect a uh, confidence building measure on the other side of the border? Like I am, my father was born in Pakistan and we were never taught hatred. And we, we, we grew up listening to Punjabi songs, but how do, we can forget partition, but there has to be some action uh, following the statements or following all these very good things about confidence building measures and all that stuff. So I just want your take on that. Thank you. So I don't know which particular incident you're referring to in terms of the, uh, uh, no, no, when you talked about uh, the prime minister, but these things are not gonna be solved unless we speak because uh, we need to deliberate on the evidence. We need to explain to you what the difficulties are in terms of the in terms of the time lag, in terms of the uh, conviction. So all these, we have to be on the table to be able to talk about these things so that we can explain to you where our judici judicial system is in the process of um, of that particular case that you're referring to. Before we end, I, maybe I'll just take a round in terms of, um, I know always ends up as an India-Pakistan <laughs> debate uh, inevitably, but still, uh, just I'll ask each one of the panelists to say how hopeful are they about that this <coughs> movement of inte economic integration will take place in this region? Maybe give a timeline, five years, 10 years, one year, um, or give some kind of a rating uh, to see that where we're heading in this direction, or how would you see the future here? Or I, don't, I think we are integrating and we will continue to integrate I just don't think it's happening as fast as the potential of integration is, and that's where the disappointment lies. But I think the trend is on the right side, and as new generations of leaders come in, as we're already seeing, some of the uh, hygiene factors that have been at play will dissipate. So integration is an end point, uh, whether it is for financial integration or monetary integration or regulatory integration and harmonization. But in order to get to an end point, you need to have a process and a certain set of outcomes. Uh, and in order to set up processes, you need institutional arrangements. And currently, we do not have the processes in place. And currently, we do not have the institutional arrangements in place. So I think um, uh, I'll, I'll end with what I started with in the beginning. We need to start talking and we need to have the, the convening space that can be insulated from political interference on either side. And, uh, and that would be the first uh, entry point to making progress. Ajay? Uh, well, at this time, things don't look so great. Uh, but, uh, you know, we are always optimistic. And economic logic is a very powerful logic. So eventually, just the sheer economic logic uh, will drive integration. Uh, I'm just concerned about the pace of it. I think that if all stakeholders get together, this can happen a lot faster uh, and uh, can bring benefit much, much, much more quickly than you and I can imagine at this time. Vijay? I'd say that um, we as Indians will integrate far more closely and faster with other neighboring economies Nepal, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and others, um, versus Pakistan, I believe that this has become, uh, like we all understood, uh, significantly political. And Ajay added an angle there that there is a little bit ahead of political conversation there. So I'm significantly less hopeful. I still believe we'll be 10 years forward, and we still might be doing a business via Dubai or some Middle Eastern country. Sorry, what did you say? Yeah. We still will be doing business that way. Because like we all are talking pace, it's so small and the rate is so less that even 10% progress is a very large number to achieve in 10 years. Okay. I, I can only say that uh, we all recognize the huge opportunities which is there uh, and the great benefits which would apply, which will accrue to all the countries involved. Um, politics is, of course, the big uh, stumbling block between India and Pakistan and these two countries 
have to overcome this, as Ajay has said, put this, if they can put the politics aside and start talking about trade, start uh, um, improve connectivity, I think this is, uh, would help in terms of not only the politics part of it, but of course the economic benefit which will accrue to the whole region. So I want to thank my panelists for their comments. Thank you. Thank you all.